Right now at 6, troubling images of a plane's final moments. We're going to be doing everything within our uh, facility skill sets uh, to try to determine the probable cause. What we're learning this evening about the three young people on board. Plus, we're asking to help with the short staffing and Kaiser executive said no. A look at the local impacts of the largest healthcare worker strike in U.S. history. Then a race against time with no ambulance available. This is obvious, like these guys literally saved my life. The tech and quick thinking that helped a stroke victim survive. Thanks for joining us. I'm David Molko and we begin at six with investigators now at the crash site in Newburgh where a small plane plummeted out of the sky right into a home. We have some new video just in from that scene as crews started lifting parts of the plane off and out of the house so they can begin the often painstaking work of trying to figure out what went wrong. We also learned the two people on board who died were a young flight instructor and a student pilot. Let's get right to China Green live in Newburgh with the latest China. Yeah, David, we have learned that all three people on board this plane were in their early 20s, all living in Hillsboro. Let me get out of the way so you can see the situation right now. So what you're seeing is an alleyway right behind the house you have been seeing all day long as we've been live at this scene. The NTSB and FAA have removed the plane. It is now on a flatbed. They will take that away to continue their investigation to learn exactly what went wrong here. And a warning, some of the video you're about to see in this story is disturbing to watch. It was scary. Very scary. This video was taken by a neighbor just before seven last night as the plane was spiraling down. It imp impacted a residential structure uh, towards the back of the house. And at this time, it is undetermined as to why. Crashing nose down through the roof of this house on North Cedar Street in Newburgh. With victims, potential victims inside, we started a rapid extrication. Newburgh Dundee police say there were three people on board that plane, all living in Hillsborough. 20 year old Barrett Bavacqua and 22 year old McKelly Cavalier were found dead in the aircraft. Cavallotti was an instructor for the Hillsborough Aero Academy and Bavacqua was a student pilot. And when we got here, life flight was landing. There was ambulances blocking off the street. The third person on that plane was 20 year old Emily Hurd sitting in the back. She was airlifted to OHSU with critical injuries. A Facebook post online from her mom says as of 7:30 this morning, surgery went well and her spinal cord is intact. The post also said she has both sternal rib and pelvic fracture. When it comes to those who were inside the home, firefighters say everyone ran out safely after the plane crashed. Today, the homeowners came back to the home and grabbed some essential items. Some investigators from the FAA and the NTSB are now here looking for a cause. But according to FlightAware, a flight tracking website, the plane is a Piper Seminole owned by a Hillsborough Aero Academy. It took off around 6.20 Tuesday night before losing airspeed and crashing from 5,000 feet. And then we heard a kaboom, and I just felt like it was a plane. KGW News caught up with a neighbor whose young child was playing in the front yard of the house. And I ran out to see if my boy was okay and they were crying. I said, did the plane hit the house? They go, yeah, it hit his buddy's house. Now the focus shifts to why. Was weather a factor? We're going to be taking a look at the airplane itself. We're going to be looking at airplane maintenance records. Was there a potential uh, was there any kind of mechanical anomalies that would have precluded normal operations? And China, I mean, your heart really goes out to these two grieving families. So many questions. How long could it be before they get some answers here? Well, we were told that the investigation could take anywhere from a year and a half up to two years to wrap up. But hey, if you have any video of this or if you saw the crash happen, NTSB would like all the information. You can give that to them at witness at NTSB.org. David? Yeah, so important. China Green there in Newburgh. China, appreciate your reporting tonight. Let's get to your headlines now, starting with new federal funding for the Rose City to combat its growing car theft problem. The Smart Policing Initiative grant, $800,000 from the Department of Justice, is meant to help police gather data on stolen vehicles and to develop a digital database. The goal here to help officers better identify and then find stolen cars. More than 10,000 vehicles have been reported stolen in Portland alone so far this year. 
experts met at OHSU this morning to look at gun violence prevention through a public health lens. Researchers explained overall firearms injuries and deaths have increased in recent years. Suicide in Oregon is 40% higher than the national average and firearms are the most common cause of death in children. It's something that we have to be really, really cognizant of. Um, the amount of guns that are present in the community are something that the horse is out of the barn. We have to think about how we can impact these things. Experts listed gun safes, protective orders, and mental health holds, plus more research and education as among the most promising and current solutions. Voters in Lane County have apparently overwhelmingly rejected a recall of their state representatives. Unofficial results show just over 90% of voters saying no to recall Democrat Paul Holvey. This recall vote was forced by the United Food and Commercial Workers after a committee that Holvey chairs tabled a bill that would have allowed cannabis industry workers to unionize. Holvey is the second ranking Democrat in the House. He has held office since 2004. Matt? Thanks so much, David. It took a while, but the sun finally broke through today. We're still on track for some very warm and really great October weather. Started at the coast today. We had some fog out by Newport, but that burned off super quickly and left us with sunshine pretty much all around the state. We were the last to see the clouds clear, but clear they have. And really, there's very little cloud cover in our forecast for this next several days ahead. We'll have some fog around tomorrow morning. After that, it's all clear and it stays clear because we pick up a northeast or easterly wind Thursday afternoon into Friday and even early Saturday. That'll keep us clear and warm us into the 80s, at least on Friday and Saturday. Not the latest in the year we've ever hit 80 degrees, David, but certainly some very, very pleasant weather. And there is rain in the forecast too. Early next week, we'll have the timing and how much a little bit later on. Back to you. Yeah, a lot to keep an eye on. Thanks so much, Matt. Well, it is the largest healthcare worker strike in U.S. history with 4,000 Kaiser Permanente employees here in the Northwest joining tens of thousands of their colleagues across the country on the picket line. So let's get to Thomas Schultz live at one of the strike locations in Clackamas County. Uh, Thomas looks busy behind you. What are you hearing about negotiations? Yeah, David, so far negotiations are not going well and you can see there's still dozens of people picketing who have been out here all morning. Union members say Kaiser walked away from the bargaining table today and they're not going to come back until the, it, the strike ends on Friday. That decision clearly has infuriated workers. Across the Portland area, thousands of Kaiser Permanente health care workers walked out Wednesday morning straight to the picket line. They plan to stay here until Friday. For months, hundreds of position groups, from radiology technicians to medical assistants and housekeepers, have been bargaining with Kaiser for better pay and more job protections. Though the biggest problem... It is short staffing. Juanita Kamhut says she's working 80-hour weeks. Others are working long stints of overtime, too. This has never been like this. The union says Kaiser has committed unfair labor practices and isn't admitting that patient care has slipped. Across the country, 75,000 Kaiser workers are striking. Employees say many health care workers left during the pandemic, and they're still leaving. They're quitting, they're moving on to other careers even, um, just to have some sanity back because we're just so overworked. Workers say the shortage has big consequences for patients. When people are trying to make an appointment with their primary care provider and it's four to eight weeks out, we're not doing a service to our member. In a statement, Kaiser says it's addressing wages with pay hikes of 12 and a half percent over the next four years. The healthcare giant says every health care provider has faced staffing shortages since the pandemic, though they have fared better than most because of higher pay and better benefits. And it's accelerated hiring this year, too. The workers aren't seeing a change. The care is tough because there's just not enough of us to care for everybody, you know, our hospital staff. Now, Kaiser has also ha hired some temporary workers at some locations, and these staff members' jobs will also be filled by physicians and other managers until the strike ends on Friday. It's also important to note, David, there's another strike going on at Kaiser Permanente with pharmacist workers. That strike is going to go on until October 21st. They claim that Kaiser has not been bargaining in good faith. 
David. Yeah, two strikes going on at the same time. Thomas Schultz in Clackamas County. Appreciate that update there. Coming up tonight on this story, new data shows how the fentanyl crisis that is gripping our communities is also now spreading to schools. I want to bring an in investigative reporter Evan Watson here with a preview now. Evan. Yeah, David, school districts are often protective about sharing information on this subject. Potential overdoses on school grounds, it's a touchy subject, but a voluntary survey statewide in Washington shows that more and more health officials are responding to overdose-like situations. Most high schools in Washington are required to have Narcan, the opioid overdose reversal drug, on hand. Our investigative team requested the data for how often Narcan is being used in schools. Two years ago, schools reported using it six times, last school year, 42 times. And that's likely a significant undercount because schools aren't required to report this information. It's compiled in a voluntary school nurse survey. With the prevalence of fentanyl, some school districts are expanding Narcan to all schools, school buses, and more staff members. We're seeing that it's happening to infants, toddlers, people that are not necessarily trying to ingest drugs <laughs> and they're being exposed and overdosing. Tonight at 630, David, we're going to take a look at an inspiring high school student who is really taking matters into her own hands to try to educate a lot of her peers about what to do in this, uh, but also a deeper look at that data and what we're learning from the use of Narcan and these potential overdose situations that are happening at school grounds. Super important to keep talking about this, and she sounds like a trailblazer. Looking yeah. forward to that. Thank you, Evan. You got it.